Jerry, I have to say, is doing this not just in friendly audiences like this, but behind enemy lines in places like Dearborn, Michigan. So I say, welcome, Jerry Boykin. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I uh, thank so much, Frank. And, uh, and let me say very sincerely that what I'm going to talk about today and uh, talk to you about really is epitomized by Frank Gaffney. And that is really a question of what price are you willing to pay for America? What price are you individually willing to pay for America? Are you sold out to this country? Does this country mean as much to you as it did to those 56 men that signed that declaration that separated us from the crown of England? Frank is one of those people that has sold out to that and the rest of his life will be spent supporting and defending the things that he holds most dear. And that's the constitution of this nation. Now before I speak, and any of you that have heard me speak, you know I have to do a survey. I have to know if I've got any Marines out in my audience. Are there any Marines out here? Okay, we got Marines here, 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 and here. Okay, some of you guys that were in the Army, I want you to get up and go sit next to one of these Marines in case I use a big word, you can explain it to them. Okay? All right. Now, I want you to understand that I grew up around the Marine Corps. I grew up in eastern North Carolina around uh, Camp Lejeune and Cherry Point Marine Air Barracks. In fact, my dad was at Cherry Point for uh, 32 years. So I understand the Marine Corps, and I, thought, I always thought I'd be in the Marine Corps. And then, uh, you know, when I went to sign up, my, my IQ test proved that I was a little too bright to be in the Marine Corps. So <laughs> I had to go to the Army. But that wasn't really what got me. It was when I filled out my application, and there was a thing there that said, are your parents married? And I said, yes. And they said, well, you got to go to the Army. <laughs> Now, okay, let me tell you one Marine story before I get into what I want to say to you today. So this Marine got off of work one day and he pulled out of a Quantico Marine base out on the 95. He was heading into Washington and there was a car on the side of the road. He pulled over and he said, hey, buddy, what's the matter? He said, well, my car broke down. But I've called AAA. They're going to come and get me. And the Marine said, is there any way I can help you? And the guy said, well, as a matter of fact, there is. He said, I'll give you $100 if you'll take these two chimpanzees in my back seat and you'll take them into the National Zoo. The Marine said, 100 bucks. Yeah, I'll do that. He went over and got him two chimpanzees, put them in his car, and headed off towards the National Zoo. About an hour later, the record came along, was pulling this guy's car down into Washington, and he looked, and here's the Marine walking down the street with a chimpanzee in each hand. He said to the driver of the record, he said, stop, stop, stop. He rolled the window down, and he said, yo, I thought I told you to take them to the zoo. The Marine said, oh, well, I did, and there was some money left over. Now I'm taking them shopping. <laughs> my theme for, uh, for my talk today, and it really kind of segues with what uh, Ms. Bachman said last night and uh, what your speaker just now just said, and uh, my, really it is my theme is Wake up, America. Get up, America. And ask yourself what price you're willing to pay for this country. Look, when those 56 men signed that declaration, they knew that they were marking themselves to be executed by the crown of England because, in fact, they were traitors to the crown. And they said to each other, we pledge mutually, we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And if you look at the history, and it depends on what historian you read, but at least nine of them didn't live through the revolution. These men were serious men. When they signed that declaration, they were very serious. When they made that pledge, they were very serious. And at least nine of them didn't live through the revolution. In fact, some historians would tell you maybe as many as 17 of them died as a result of uh, signing that document and being part of this new revolution. Those men, Many of them lost everything they had. In fact, some of the families actually had to borrow money to bury these men, 
These great men that walked into Philadelphia and signed that document, some of them died penniless, lost everything they had, and they were very wealthy men in most cases. But you know, none of them ever compromised. There's nothing in history that says they ever compromised their sacred honor. They stood firm for what they believed in, this concept of freedom. But there was a thread. Aside from the fact that they loved the concept of freedom, there was another thread that bound them together. And in spite of the revisionist historians, that thread was their faith. They were men of faith. And I see these historians today that talk about George Washington being a deist. George Washington believed there was a God, but he created the earth and then left it to man. He didn't believe in the Trinity or in, in the birth of Jesus Christ. Well, read what George Washington said as he was coming to the end of his life. George Washington said, I trust my future into the hands of Jesus Christ. That's not a deist. And those who say that Thomas Jefferson was a deist, there was more legislation passed under Thomas Jefferson that supported the church and the freedom of religion than any other president in history. These were not deists. These were men of faith. The foundations of this nation are Judeo-Christian. And they want to rob us of that fact today. All of these people that are rewriting our history are trying to do one thing, and that is take away the Judeo-Christian base upon which our nation was founded. And let me tell you, when that happens, we will become like Europe. In fact, the reason that Europe is lost is because Europe has walked away from its faith. Europe has walked away from what it was. Think of the great revivals that came out of England. Think of the impact that Greece has had on our faith, on the religion. And do you know that in Greece today, less than 10% of the people there attend church on a regular basis. And it is the same thing in Britain. And it's the same thing all over Europe. You wonder why Europe is in the mess that it's in today? It is because they've lost their identity and now they can be led in any direction because they don't know where they came from. And where they came from was a Judeo-Christian base and it's happening in America. Yeah, Frank said, I've been persecuted by the media because of my faith. I've been called everything, a radical evangelical, a holy warrior. I've, been, I've had Hitler mustaches painted on me. But let me tell you something, I know enough about our history that I know what our faith was. In 1787, the great statesman, Benjamin Franklin, walked out in the streets of Philadelphia after helping to write this new constitution, and a woman walked up to Benjamin Franklin. She said, tell me, Mr. Franklin, what kind of government have you given us? And most of you know the story. He's so famous famously replied to this lady, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. A republic, if you can keep it. What did he mean? And I believe that what Benjamin Franklin realized was that this, for as long as we existed, this concept of liberty, this government based on the Judeo-Christian roots would be challenged, would be challenged by people who would want to destroy us. It would be challenged by those from outside, but it would also be challenged by those from inside. Ben Franklin knew that we were going to have to fight to defend and protect this concept of liberty, these liberties that were given to us. Listen, these were not flawless men. We know that. They still supported slavery when they wrote this constitution, but we fought a civil war in this nation we shed the blood of tens of thousands of our citizens that all men, all men might understand and appreciate and be part of this concept of liberty. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, which was, as you probably know, was changed from property. We as a nation are a great nation, but we still continue to have to fight today to preserve this. Listen. I want to say to you that as far as I'm concerned, every one of us needs to be proud of who we are as Americans. I am so proud to be an American. I don't walk down the streets of Europe and try to conceal the fact that I'm an American. And I've seen people who do that. I'm proud of the fact that I'm American.
Listen, the problem is the Europeans envy us. The rest of the world envies us. We are a great nation. And I will tell you also, I am infuriated by the fact that our president is going around to these piddly countries and apologizing for us. Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, I've shed my own blood, but more importantly, I've seen men die for this country. I've seen men that were willing to do anything they had to do to protect this nation and to serve that flag. Listen, that flag right there, that flag has to do two things. It has to strike fear in the hearts of those who believe they are our enemies, and it has to bring great hope. You know, the night we captured Manuel Noriega in Panama, as he was coming out of the Nunciatura, I said, you go get the flag. Bring me a flag, and I had him stand that flag up right in the doorway as he was coming out so that when he walked out, he'd see that flag, and it would strike fear in his heart. Well, let me tell you something. When he walked out in a starched uniform, standing erect with his head high, the first thing he saw was the American flag, and I want you to know he turned away and he wilted because that flag struck fear into his heart. Yes. Be proud of who you are as an American. We are a great nation. We have fought. We have sent our sons and daughters to fight all over the world that other people might enjoy the liberties that we have. We still fight today to preserve what we know as liberty. We are the most benevolent nation the world has ever seen. We, have, we always get there first with the most. In fact, most of the time, we deliver more than the rest of the world put together. We're a benevolent nation. Were it not for America, the whole continent of Europe would be goose-stepping and speaking German, and the continent of Asia would be speaking Japanese. We've saved the world. Be proud to be an American, but understand that we're going to continue to be challenged. Today, our challenges are many. But our greatest challenges are from within. Our greatest challenges, ladies and gentlemen, are from that 30% that our speaker just talked about. And I will tell you something else. I'm a history buff, but I will tell you that I am also a special forces officer. <laughs> you know what that is? Now, you see, that guy says he's special forces. He's really a Marine because that is the Marine Corps mating call. <laughs> All the Marines get like that in the spring of the year normally. <laughs> you know, it, listen, as a special forces officer, my training forced me to study insurgencies. During my years in the Delta Force, I was forced to study and understand insurgency. And most of that was all about Marxist insurgency. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, this nation is moving to Marxism. I've seen the pattern. I've seen the model. I understand it, as do many others like Frank Gaffney. And I hope that he'll have an opportunity to talk about this. We're moving towards Marxism. I've been criticized for saying this, and people all the time say you're a fear monger. No, I'm not. I'm the watchman on the tower, and I'm telling you, we are moving towards Marxism. Now, let me tell you, let me tell you what that model looks like. You can look at any Marxist insurgency, and this is what they've done. Without exception, this is what they've done. In fact, start with Castro and then go to uh, Venezuela, look at Mao Zedong, look at other Marxist insurgencies that ultimately become communism. And here's what they do. The first thing they do is they nationalize major sectors of the industry because the government has to have control of the economy. What do you think the bailout was? That was nationalization. Who do you think owns General Motors today? You and I do. And by the way, this is an editorial and, and you can you can, I'll never buy another car from GM or Chrysler. No, I mean that. But here's my reason. Because of the way they treated some car dealers right here on the front range of the Rockies. And some of you in the state government know who I'm talking about and what I'm talking about. The way those two companies treated the car dealers right here, I'll never buy another one. I can promise you that. But nationalization, that's exactly what the bailout was. That's the first step in controlling the population. 
The second thing they do is guess what? What do you think? They redistribute wealth. Now normally in South America and Central America they've called it land reform. All it is is redistribution of wealth. Well, have we heard enough about the redistribution of wealth? And by the way, do you think health care was anything other than redistribution of wealth? That's part of the Marxist model. It's part of what every Marxist regime has done as they've moved towards being a Marxist society. The third thing they do is they discredit the opposition. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. I have never been so angry with my government as when Janet Napolitano issued a declaration to law enforcement all across this country saying that the future threats to America are right-wing Christian groups, pro-life groups, Second Amendment groups, and returning veterans, and never once said Islamic terrorist. Ladies and gentlemen, what was that all about? It was about discrediting the very groups that would have the cojones to stand up and say, we will not support this. That's right. It was about discrediting the opposition, the people that they fear most, those people that have made an investment in this country when they said the veterans. Discredit the opposition. The next thing they do is censor. Look at it. What, did you see where Hugo Chavez bought all the uh, radio stations or shut them down, wouldn't let them broadcast? Well, in our case, censorship comes in the form of what? Not just this concept of the fairness doctrine, which, by the way, is not an attempt to have more liberal radio. It's an attempt to shut Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh and Frank Gaffney down. That's what it's about because nobody listens to liberal radio. That's why Air America had to go off the airways. Nobody listens to it. Why would they? I mean, unless you, you just won't take an afternoon nap, why would you listen to it? What it's all about is shutting those conservative radio programs down by saying, well, you can't find an equal hour of liberal radio. And this keeps coming up. Yes, I know we've had it before. I didn't support it then, and I def definitely don't support it now. But watch it, it's censorship. But more importantly, is the hate crimes legislation. You know who the hate crimes legislation is about? You know who it's directed at? Sir, it is directed at you. As a conservative in a Christian college, it is directed at you. It is directed at you that are pastors of churches. It's you that are ministers and evangelists that have an audience. Hate crimes legislation is directed at you. And it is about locking you up when you get up in the pulpit or you get up in an auditorium and you talk about abortion, same-sex marriage, homosexuality, and Islam, and you say that can't happen in America. Well, I will tell you something, friends, it's happened in Canada. Our neighbors to the north have had pastors locked up in jail. Our friends over in Europe have had exactly the same thing happen under this hate crimes legislation. And how many of you in this audience have heard of the mother and father who lost their daughters, they were homeschoolers, and lost their daughters in Germany because of hate crimes legislation. Any of you heard of that? They took the daughters away because they were teaching them conservative values. And when they protested and said, we have the right to do that, we're homeschooling, we're Germans, our constitution says that we can do this. What they were told in response was, well, that was when we were just Germany. Now we're part of the European Union. And by the way, we ceded that part of our constitution to this larger constitution called the European Union, and it has hate crimes legislation. Ladies and gentlemen, hate crimes legislation is part of the censorship that's part of the Marxist model that America is going through right now. The next thing that they do in every society is they control gun ownership. Now I know that some of you have seen that this knucklehead up in Chicago, and I'm not talking about the president, I'm talking about this <laughs> congressman up there that keeps introducing this House Resolution 45, wanting to register and tax all your guns. Well, he's, the NRA is gonna be strong enough to stop him, but what I'm really worried about is the fact that in May, the president announced that he was going to sign the United Nations Small Arms Treaty. 
which pr I promise you, and John Bolton, the former U ambassador, has given a good uh, a presentation on this, I promise you that is going to wind up in restricting gun ownership in this country. That's what's going to happen. You better pray that we've got enough conservatives in the Senate that they will not ratify this treaty when the time comes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the last thing that they always do is they develop a constabulary force. They have to have a constabulary force to control the population. Hitler had the brown shirts. And oh, by the way, in the night of the long knives, Hitler got so scared of them himself that he wound up killing over half of them. You say a constabulary force in this nation. Well, how many of you have ever watched on YouTube the video of our current president when he stood up before he was elected and said, as president, I will have a national civilian security force that as large as and as well equipped as the United States military. And I say, for what purpose? You have police at all level. You have federal, state, and local police. You also have the National Guard that, by the way, on a day-to-day -day basis works for the governor, the governor of the state. They only work for the Secretary of Defense when they're nationalized under Title 10 or federalized. So why does he need a national civilian security force? And oh, by the way, have any of you read the health care legislation? Don't worry about it. Nobody in Washington has either. It's in there, isn't it? It's in there. It talks about the commissioning of officers that will work directly for the president in time of crisis. That's the beginning, the foundations of a constabulary force to control the populations. Ladies and gentlemen, we are moving to Marxism. And I'm going back to my main theme, which is wake up and get up and decide what price you're willing to pay. The second great threat to this nation is Islam. Look, I'm a marked man, I'm a wanted man. I've got threats against me for standing up and saying this kind of thing, but I'm gonna tell you something. My wife and I are to the point that we don't care anymore. I don't care. You gotta wake up and understand what we're dealing with here. This is a serious threat. This can take over America. You say it can't happen here. It can't happen here. Ladies and gentlemen, look at Europe. If you think it cannot happen in America, look at Europe. All the experts will tell you that by the middle of this century, Europe will be an Islamic continent. All the experts include Bernard Lewis, who is probably the most renowned expert in America on Islam. By the middle of this century, the whole continent will be an Islamic continent. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for us as Americans to wake up. Let me tell you just a little bit about this. And Frank, I hope that Frank will talk about this because he is an authority on it. He spends his life studying this stuff. Sharia law. I hope he'll talk about this this afternoon. And tonight, by the way, do not miss Kamal Salim tonight. He will be here late tonight, but he will be speaking to you. And he is one of the people that Frank and I are trying to tell people about. They came to America to destroy America, to take over America. You see, most of us are focused on this thing called terrorism. Michelle Bachman said last night, Americans are concerned about terrorism. And indeed, we should be. But let me tell you something. Terrorism is not the problem. It is a problem, but it's not the problem. Terrorism will never destroy us as a nation. It will strike fear into our hearts. But terrorism will not destroy us. They can't defeat us through terrorism. The threat to America is this thing called the Muslim Brotherhood. You see, when I came in the Army in 1970, at the height of the Cold War, we thought nothing could ever threaten us the way the Soviet Union did because they had an arsenal that could destroy us and we had one that could destroy them and we called it Mutual Assured Destruction, MAD. And that's exactly what it was, it was MAD. It was just MAD. But at the end of the day, both sides wanted to live. Neither side wanted to die for what they believed in or to spread their brand of government. Today we're up against an enemy that's willing to die. No. 
Let me correct. He's not willing to die. He wants to die for his faith. Ladies and gentlemen, the Muslim Brotherhood infiltrated our nation over three decades ago. That's not a euphemism. In fact, one of the guys that founded this went to school right here in Colorado in the 20s and then went back to, Chi to Cairo and founded the Muslim Brotherhood. And they infiltrated America over three decades ago and they have told us consistently what they intend to do and their statement is simple. They intend to dominate America. You say it can't happen in America. It's happening in Europe and it is too late for Europe. So don't say it can't happen here. These people are serious about what they're doing. They tell us repeatedly that they're going to dominate America and Islam will be the religion of America and that we will all be subjected to Sharia law. Let me tell you something. What they want to do is destroy this constitution and replace it with Sharia law. That is their stated intent destroy the American Constitution that was written in 1787 and replace it with Sharia law. That's what their intentions are. And when Nadal Hassan went running through that army facility on the 5th of November yelling Allah Akbar, he was doing that because he was part of that war that is going on to destroy our Constitution. And he told people ahead of time in a meeting with Senior medical officers in the United States Army, he told them in his briefing, look it up on the web, a 50 slide briefing, that he did not support and defend the Constitution of the United States. He supported Sharia law, which is the fundamental tenet of Islam. These people are serious about what they're doing. We found in Annandale, Virginia, a five phase plan in a false basement that was hidden there we found it, the FBI found it. They are in the latter part, at least the latter part of phase three of the takeover of America. You do not understand how ingrained they are in our society. They're in every sector of our society. You don't understand the millions and millions and millions of dollars coming into our universities. Petrodollars that are being used to set up Islamic studies that are nothing but propaganda. And we're buying the lies. Americans across the country are buying the lies. Listen, I was in New York the day the city council of New York voted 29 to 1 to build a mosque at ground zero, and I was grieved. Ladies and gentlemen, do you understand when, when Muhammad came back and conquered Mecca, he built a mosque at the most holy site there, the Kaaba, because he wanted to send a statement that Islam reigns supreme. When he conquered Jerusalem, where did he build his mosque? At the most holy site, right on the top of Mount Moriah, where Abraham offered up Isaac to send a statement to the Christians and the Jews. Allah reigns supreme. Islam is the religion of this land. And now they destroyed our towers and we are going to allow them to build a mosque at the site where that, those towers were. And what's the message of that? Islam reigns supreme. You think they're not taking over America? You think they're not a serious threat? You need to find out what's going on. Ladies and gentlemen, don't say it can't happen here because it is happening here. When you look at the Department of Homeland Security and you find out that two of the most senior people there are Muslims, you find out that there are other Muslims that are known to be supporters of terrorism are inside our government advising our president, the man that went over to represent us in the Middle East at the Organization of Islamic Council is a man who has openly supported terrorist activities. And he's over there representing America. It's not terrorism that we need to be worried about. It is this incremental takeover of our nation. Ladies and gentlemen, Islam is protected by the First Amendment and the rights of most Americans. I personally do not feel that way. I believe that every Muslim that believes that Islam is just a religion must be allowed to worship. The problem is what Frank said, 
those that live under the dictates of the Quran and the Hadith are the people that have formed the Muslim Brotherhood. And they believe that Islam is a totalitarian way of life. If they are living under the authoritative dictates of Islam, it is an authoritative, totalitarian way of life. It's a legal system. It's a moral code. It is a financial system. Michelle Bachman told me a year ago at dinner, her state passed a law allowing the practice of Sharia finance law in Minnesota. Do you realize that when you are paying into Sharia finance compliant loans, you are paying to support terrorism because 2.5% of the interest on those loans goes into what is called zakat. Category number seven of zakat is those fighting in the cause of Allah. They are the terrorists. We are supporting terrorism when we pay into a Sharia comp compliant loan. We're funding our own demise. The Holy Land Foundation trial in 2008. How many of you have ever even heard of the Holy Land Foundation trial? Not very many. And that's because the media doesn't want to tell you about it. It was the largest terrorist financing trial in the history of America. They convicted the defendants on all 108 counts of raising money in America to fund terrorism, much of which was directed against this country. But that wasn't what was important. What was important was they came up with an unindicted co-conspirator list, and I've got a bunch of lawyers right here on the front row, and they'll correct me, but what that means when you're on an unindicted co-conspirator list is that I've got the evidence on you. I just don't have the time or resources to prosecute you. And they came up with an unindicted co-conspirator list of over 200 people and organizations. And at the top of that list was the Council of American Islamic Relations, the leading, number one, largest, most respected Muslim organization in America, CARE. And when they went back to the judge and said, would you take us off the list? He said, not only will I not take you off the list, but I'm going to publish the list and make it public. And when he did, yeah, God bless him. When he did, they started trying to destroy all their documents before the FBI raided them, and they handed all their documents to a summer intern who was, unbeknownst to them, a plant. They did not realize that he was only pretending to be a Muslim convert, and he took all those documents and took them back to his father and another guy in Washington named Paul Sperry, an investigative reporter, and they wrote a marvelous book from those documents called The Muslim Mafia. And it will tell you, if you'll read that book, what's going on in America from their own words, from their own plans, from what they are saying they intend to do. Don't say it can't happen in America. Ladies and gentlemen, it is happening in America. And it is time for Americans to wake up, get up, and get involved in what is going on in our country. I'm gonna tell you two quick war stories, and look, I want you to buy these two books here. When I, I'll be out at the table. I'll, I'll stay out there till midnight if I have to because I want to sell all those books because you need these books. But more importantly, I need that money. So, <laughs> now what's wrong with that? No. Our previous speaker talked about capitalism. I'm a capitalist. I need your money. So buy these books out there and I'll sign them for you. But look, let me tell you something. You know what? I was a commander of the Delta Force in the Black Hawk Down events in Mogadishu, Somalia. And after that first Black Hawk Down, when Black Hawk was shot down, I sent everybody to that first Black Hawk. There was a second Black Hawk shot down 30 minutes later. I'd send everything we had to that first Black Hawk. And there were two men that watched that second Black Hawk go in, Randy Shugart and Gary Gordon, two Delta Force snipers. And they called on the radio and they said, sir, the, the helicopter's down. We see it, and those men are still alive, they said. They said, we, we still see it. They're moving around. They can't get out, but they're moving around. They're alive. Put us in. And I said to them, I can't put you in, guys. I don't have anybody to support you with. I sent everybody to the first crash. I said, stay above them. Keep shooting your sniper rifles and your door guns and, and protect them. And they called me back in a few minutes. They said, sir, there's just too many Somalis. We're doing the best we can but they're getting closer and we got, we, we put us in, they said. I said, guys, I got nothing to support you. Well, I'm, I'm getting everybody together now. I'm forming a rescue effort right now, but I got nothing to help you with. I said, 
I, just, just do the best you can. They kept shooting, and a few minutes later, they called me back, and they said, they said, sir, they said, we're the only hope. They said, put us in. We're the only hope. I said a quick prayer, and I ordered the helicopter to put those men in. The helicopter made a pass, and he came around and hovered low, and they jumped out, and they fought their way into the crash site. They very carefully got their four buddies out of that crash, and then they just got around on the other side of the helicopter, and they started engaging the Somalis as they came across the. Finally, Gary Gordon came back around to the co-pilot, and he said, is there any more ammunition? He said, there's ammunition behind the seat, and he ran back in the crash, and, and he got the ammunition out from behind the seat, and he laid a little short submachine gun on on Mike Durant's chest and said, good luck. And he went back around on the other side of the helicopter and threw ammunition over to Randy Shugart and he kept fighting. They just kept shooting. And finally, Gordon, Gordon heard Randy Shugart yell out, Gordy, Gordy, I'm hit. I'm hit bad. And then his gun went silent and Randy Shugart was dead. And then he heard Mike Durant, the pilot, said, then he heard... Uh, he heard Gary Gordon yell out, Mike, I'm hit. Man, I'm, I'm hit. And then he went silent and he was dead. I stood in the White House as the president presented the medals of honor to the widows and the children and the families of those two very brave men. And as I stood there in the White House, I thought, what did they die for? What did they die for? Uh, why? And the answer is they died for something they believed in. They died for those four men on the ground. Those four men meant everything to them. You know what? It was more precious than life itself to them. Those four men, because they were committed to them. Those were their mates, their buddies. They were committed to those men. And today I see Americans all over this country that are uninformed that take elections frivolously, that don't want to get involved, yet they're the first to want something, to want something from this government. And I say to you, every one of you needs to determine what price you're willing to pay for this nation. I don't want to die for this country. I don't want to die for my faith, but I will. My wife and I have talked about it. And I said to her when we had the latest threat, I said, I'll, I'll stop. I won't talk about Islam anymore. I'll stop. And she looked at me and she said, one day you and I are going to stand before God. And I'd rather say to him, God, I'm here a little early because I was doing what you told me to do than, than God, I was scared and I went and hid. And then she looked at me and she said, go get me another pistol. Yeah, that's all I'm about. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, you've got to rise up. I'm not, I'm not advocating the overthrow of this government. I'm saying rise up. Get involved in what's going on. Get in the race. Run for office. If you share these, con these values, you get in the race. You run for office. And I'm also telling you, get in behind somebody that is willing to run for office, that shares your values. Put your money in, in behind them. Put your support in behind them. And pray for America. You see, the church has been asleep. There's over 65 million that consider themselves born-again Christians. And when you add the Catholics to that, there's well over 100 million people in this country that are Christians. Less than half of them are even registered to vote and less than half of those that are registered even voted. You ever hear the story of John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg in 1776 that stood up in his church in Woodstock, Virginia and preached from Ecclesiastes 3 and said, there's a time for peace and there's a time for war. And he took his vestments off to reveal the uniform of the 8th Virginia Regiment. And he went out and got on his horse and he said, and who will fight with me this day? 
and he led over 300 men through the revolution. The church needs to be in the lead. You people of faith, you need to rise up. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. The most important thing that we have to do as Americans, as Christians, is pray for this country. Get on your faces and pray for America. May God bless you all and God bless America. Thank you.